Good morning to you all. I welcome you on behalf of the Church of Christ who meet here in Olympia. For us, today is a day of special remembrance during which we recall the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus of Nazareth, in whom we recognize the Son of God. It is my task at the moment to remind you of some lesser matters. They are the following. This service is being live streamed for those not attending in person. People in cars in our parking lot can tune into it at 88.7 FM. The Search TV program broadcasts on channel 11, Sundays at 7 a.m., channel two, Sundays at 8 a.m., Wednesday, Wednesdays at 10.30 a.m., and Fridays at 8.30 a.m. Our Sunday morning classes convene at 9.30 a.m. Don Jacobs teaching the Book of Ruth, Jiwoo Ryu teaching the subject Simply Christian. The Wednesday adult teen class meets at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. On Wednesdays. Uh, Don Jacobs leading uh, the subject matter is defending the faith. Uh, you are advised to see the e-bulletin for Lincoln passwords uh, relating to the above classes. Faith builders uh, will convene uh, July 8 through 10. In person at Lakeview Congregation in Tacoma will also be live streamed on Zoom and YouTube. Uh, please adjust your schedules so that you can participate. Change of Life cans for the Mountain States Children's Home are available. Please pick one up and fill it with change. Turn in date is August 9th. Three Minute Thursday devotionals uh, provide, produced, promoted, performed by Don and Chi Wu. These are videos on Facebook and they're available at each week. Uh, that done. This morning's keynote scripture is found in Psalms chapter 11, beginning at verse 3 and ending also. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, if you will bow with me, we will conclude this introduction with a short prayer. Heavenly Father, creator and sustainer of all things, we take this moment to, to acknowledge you as the ultimate source of all our blessings. These ranging from the necessities of life to the necessities of life everlasting. You provide us in abundance. Help us as we seek to thank you in our words and in our deeds so that we too may join with the psalmist in saying, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in your house forever. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen.
We'll sing number 332 to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And that was from John 3.16 and following. I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. When the hour had come, he sat down with and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, 
which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to break this bread, which is Jesus' broken body on the cross for our sins. We thank you for his willingness to do so. We thank you again for this opportunity. We ask that each of us do so in a manner that pleases you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Will you pray with me again? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity. We thank you for Jesus' willingness to shed his blood on the cross that we may have the opportunity of eternal life with you. We pray that each of us will take this in a manner that pleases you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In accordance with the rest of the directions that we learn about and grow in and sharing uh, in which we've prospered, there's multiple ways to donate to continue the work that God set before us. There's a drop box in the back of the auditorium here. There's ways to donate online. And uh, please do so if you can. Uh, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the opportunities you give us to, to grow and to earn. And we pray that we'll give back to you uh, and with a willing heart to share that and help spread the word of your gospel to others around us. We thank you again for this opportunity. It's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand for the singing of this song? Worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer. Worthy of glory, honor, and power. Worthy of all our soul's adoration, worthy art thou, worthy art thou, worthy of riches, blessings, and honor, worthy of wisdom, glory, and power, worthy of Saints of all earth before him should bow, angels in heaven worship him. 
Good morning, church. Good morning. It's a blessing to be before you this morning to talk about God's word. I am not Don Jacobs, for those that don't know Don. And if you at home don't adjust your television set, you are not at the outer limits. You are watching Bobby Lumpkin and filling for Don Jacobs. When I retired, I uh, went back to school to learn the Bible. I always wanted to learn about what I believe and not always have to be taught. So I got the time to do it and I did it for three years. Uh, many has asked me, what are you gonna do now? I'm just gonna be an evangelist for the Lord. I know my Bible, me and the Lord should walk closely now. That was the whole purpose for going there. I don't think I got that something I'm missing to be a preacher. Some of you might disagree, but I don't. But you put me one-on-one -on -one with someone, we eat God's word. Up. Right now, I am nervous, but I'm going to try to get through this. I haven't done this in a whole year because I was out at the prison, and I enjoyed doing that. With that in mind, I'm going to be talking about foundations. If you're going to follow along, we're going to start out in the book of Genesis. I'm going to read about two and a half minutes of information, and it will get your mind focused on the Lord. And when you leave out of here, just the scriptures themselves would think that make you think that you connected with God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let 
there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, that was evening, and that there was morning, the first day. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps, creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, God, he created them, him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue so it and have dominion over dot, 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 all things on the earth. In the parallel verse that gives clarity to the Old Testament scripture, John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things was made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of me. The light shine in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory. The glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Our most gracious and holy Father, we thank you for the opportunity to assemble ourselves as a church, to look at a small portion of your word, that it may enrich our understanding of you, enrich our, and our behaviors that we draw closer to you, help us to look forward to eternal life with you, and help us to glorify you and share you to the world. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity and give me clarity that I may be able to speak your word in the spirit. In Christ's name, amen. I made a statement of why and how I came to this lesson. It says, in preparing this lesson, I took some time to reflect on the last past year and a half of lawlessness, lockdown, and chaos all across the country. Felt as though I was even now witnessing the foundation of this nation being destroyed. Why? Because so, because more and more people and organizations have forgotten God and the biblical moral and it, biblical moral principles. Lawlessness and immorality continue to increase in our nation. Along with enacting laws that promote godlessness behavior in the public arena, including in the public schools. This was confirmed by observing an immoral iconic color symbol flying on flagpoles all across this nation beneath our national flag. Also in February, the House and Congress approved the Equality Act. So with that in mind, I ask myself, if the foundation are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The only way you can approach that, you have to see the world in a particular order. What is your worldview? If my worldview is secular, I'm hopeless. There's nothing firm to stand on or to build on 
in this nation or in this present world we in. But if my worldview is biblical, my foundation can never be destroyed because I'm built on Christ Jesus as the rock, the son of God. You can't destroy that. They tried, it didn't work. So with that in mind, I thought about Habakkuk because we get wrapped up in a lot of stuff. It gets distracted, destructive in our mind that it distracts us from the God's word. And I know the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was going through the same thing. All the turmoil, the distress. And he prayed to God. And God answered his prayer and told Habakkuk, I'm going to send some mean people down there. They're going to mess you up and mess that country up. But this is how you handle the stuff that's coming your way. He told them the just, the righteous should live by faith. So then, what, how do we deal with it? We live by faith. Faith is the information in your head. Faith is the stuff that the Bible has put there. There's the biblical faith and there's your faith. Your faith draws on the biblical faith. So let's get into the word and get some spiritual food. So when you walk out of here, we're going to try to strengthen parts of your foundation. There's four areas that are under attack and it's constantly under attack. Our origin. Where did you come from? Did you just suddenly appear? Did some alien brought you here? Or did you, or were you created? The next one would be, what's your purpose? If you don't have an origin, you don't have a foundation in the area, you will get confused and produce a purpose for your life. But God has a specific purpose. From there, if you know God and you know you've been created, your morals, how you act, will be influenced on the attack. And the last but not least, if you get the first three correct, <laughs> your destiny, where do you go when you die? Do you just disappear in a grave to rot? Do you go to glory and be with the Son and the Father? So then let's examine what I read to you. It says, in the beginning. Think about that. In the beginning of what? All things, space, time, and the universe. Everything was created by God. But something about that creation that you can only get from the New Testament. When you read John 1, 3, it says all things was made and came into existence through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. When we read it, he says he made something like Chrysler makes a car. Like a woman have a baby with the husband. That ain't the type of made that he's talking about. What he's talking about in Hebrews 11.3 tells us that by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was made for nothing that is seen. Atoms. You know, it took us a long time to figure out that atoms exist. <laughs> DNA. If you study the Bible, the Bible will make clues and give you clues of things happening in our world. When we reject God, we reject knowledge like that. That God created all of this from nothing. His word spoke it in existence. But then it says God. The difference between our Bible in the Old Testament and the Jewish Bible, it got more meaning. When the Jews see the Bible and they read God, they see in the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth. It, it brings closeness, a relationship to them. We see word God and we translate it theos. It's like a man right there. Hi, man. But it has more meaning when I can say, hello, Jim. <laughs> see the closeness? So then when we got Elohim, which means plural for God, and that means to the Jew, he was supreme. The self-existing God created the heavens and the earth. But to speed this up, in chapter 2 of Genesis, 
we switch it up. It, it becomes God to Lord God. We translate Lord as master. But when you read the Jewish Bible or you get some program to clarify, Lord God is not Lord God. Lord God, making it personal, is Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh Elohim created everything. So we got this plurality of God, and then we got the proper name of God coming into context. They are working in unison. So then how do you explain that in the beginning was the word and the word was there with God and the word was God? You look at Elohim, God and God was there. And then it says God was hovering, the spirit of God. So all three of the Trinity, all three of the Godhead, all three of that relationship is there. And then he creates us. Why did he create us? God loves fellowship. He didn't need us, <laughs> but he created us out of his own love for mankind. What you see is what Moses got from God to write in Genesis. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Check out this reading. Elohim spoke more to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh, Lord. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Elohim among Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I, I think that is so, so beautiful. That's an extreme important, that is of extreme important if you want to grow closer to God. Then go and study your Bible and learn some of the names that God went by in the Old Testament. Adonai, the Almighty self-existent. These names has content. So when you think about God, God, if he created everything, he has to be all-powerful. He has to be all-known. He has to be all-seen. And David said, everywhere I go, you're there. So he has to be all presence. So then, everything that goes on in the world, when we experience it, God is there. God sees it. God is aware. So he says to us, don't get stressed out, buddy. <laughs> I got control of this thing. And then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish. Dot, dot, dot. God created us in his image. And when you read that, you, you have to come up with a concept, a biblical concept. My understanding of the Old Testament is that it's almost concealed. When they saw that, I can imagine what was going on in their head. But when we read the New Testament that reveals the Old Testament concealed stuff, we get a whole different ball game jumping off the page to us. So that's a, a steady rule when you study your Bible. And it states, no Old Testament Tradition will contradict an Old Testament, New Testament re revelation. And it goes in the reverse. No Old Testament revelation will uh, contradict an Old Testament revealing. Did y'all get that? They should work together in unison, just like Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That should never be a contradiction. So when I look at this lesson, it says we are made in the image of God. I'm going to approach it that God created us with three attributes of his. Holiness, righteousness, and created in the knowledge of God. Those are three attributes that can help us deal with life situations. These are three attributes that you and I must strengthen to continue to live the way God wants us to live. 
He says, I am holy, so you be holy. You have to ask yourself, what in the world is holy or holiness? Anybody really know what that means? God said, I'm going to spell it out for you. If you were reading Peter uh, 1, 14 through 16, Peter said, in your conduct. Let your conduct be holy. Let your conduct be pure. So then God wants us to be pure. That's the way he created Adam and Eve. When a baby is born, the baby is pure. The baby don't come unholy until it starts to grasp knowledge and grow up amongst us. Let's diverse a little bit. <laughs> God made Adam and Eve in his own image. Then when we get to the fifth chapter of Genesis, it says Adam had a son made in whose image now? Adam's image. So our kids and children are made in our image. If we portray holiness, and we do it a lot, and we're teaching that to our kids, guess what? Nine times out of 10, they will become holy. Now, the the problem is, we said, well, I raised my kids that way. And look at them, they're a bunch of rats. And they grown, they walked away from the Lord. That verse ain't to your kids. <laughs> that verse to you. You're supposed to teach it to them. How they turn out is not your uh, responsibility. They got the answer to God. You have to follow the rules of law. The rules of law is you and I do what we're supposed to do. And we pray for the best. But if we step back like the guy said out the field, well, look at me, I tried that. You didn't try it good enough. But what I'm saying to you is their kids end up in prison with them. And they're like, how could you say you're holy when you're in prison? The next one is righteousness. When Jesus came into the world, he got into the beatitude teaching. And part of that beatitude teaching, he said to us, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I want a job. I should pray about that job. And his righteousness. Oh, I'm going to get married. I think I'm going to study my scripture and see what God says a righteous marriage look like. Oh, hmm. I think I'm going to go and buy a new house. Maybe I need to study God's righteousness and see what God says about money how I got $50 and I should spend more than $50. And don't let someone talk you into spending more than you can afford to be in debt. So God set you up. So God set you up for success, but Satan will set you up for failure. If we seek the kingdom of God, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness or everything you want to do. And God will provide what you need. It says that in the scriptures. And then there's something about righteousness that you have to know. In Romans 10, it says that, also I have a zeal for Israel that they may be saved, but they got a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. They went and established their own righteousness and neglected the righteousness of God. So there is a self-righteousness that is out there. It's okay to do, but it goes away from God. And I think when Paul stated that, the righteousness that he's talking about is we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And then there's a transformation that takes place when we are baptized. When we go in that watery grave of baptism, I go down, Jesus come along, hang out with me there. And when I come up, the transaction has taken place. That transaction is Jesus takes my sin. And guess what he gives me? His righteousness that God wants me to have. Adam and Eve was born righteous. So God wants us to walk in righteousness. And created in the knowledge of God. God told them, be fruitful and multiply. That's knowledge. God said that I made you male and female. That's knowledge. God tells us, in chapter, tells us in chapter two, a man and a woman should be married. No other should be married. And this is where I get kind of emotional. No one can make me to believe that anybody can get married. If that's the case, it won't be long before someone married their dog 
or they gorilla or something crazy. But the interesting part is, since we are made in the image of God, there's that thing called love. Uh, there's a thing called faith. And there's that thing called hope. Uh, faith is the information that we have in our head. Hope is what we look for in the future. And love is present. Love controls what my information, that faith is in my head. Love works through faith, creating how I should act. I had an interesting conversation because this lesson was weighing on me heavy. We had to uh, elect a new vice president. And I'm talking to the individual. His name is Vincent, not Vincent Worthy. <laughs> so let's get that out there. And I asked Vincent, are you ready to take over as the vice president? You know, as the president stepped down, you've got to jump in there and enforce our covenant. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, uh, the president told me you had some eye problems. Are you going to be able to see? And as he's talking, I got this big scar on his head. It's about that long. And I asked him, well, how did you get that scar? Then he said, well, that's part of my vision problem. One night I couldn't sleep and I walked in the street down to the liquor store. And two guys pulled up. They both get out of the car with bats. One get in the front and one get in the back. And he said he knew they were not going to stop. So he grabbed the bat of the guy in front, scared him so much he turned the bat anew. But as soon as he grabbed that bat, the other one hit him in the head and they went started to beat on him. My heart melt. He said, if it wasn't for my partner, I would not have survived. So we got out of California for that reason. Now you, you think you know something and how you gonna act when something hit you, you don't know. <laughs> it hit me like a hard brick. I know two guys now living in my neighborhood. One of them is going to be my vice president, and he doesn't fit my narrative of Christianity. So what did I do? Love says, you got faith, treat him with respect. Guess what? He is born in the image of God, even though he's somewhat distorted in his thinking about what God has said. So I had compassion on him in my heart, spoke to him like a person, and walked away feeling that. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I think to God that I handled it correctly. I've never witnessed anything like that. And that's part of this lesson. When you get out and examine the people of this world, you're going to run into some people that don't believe like you believe. And what do you do? Love with the information God gives you that strengthen your knowledge. In Ephesians 2 10, it says, God is our workmanship, excuse me. We are God workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Titus would tell us in about seven times, maintain good work, stay in good work, produce good work, do good works. If you're a child of God, that is a sign of a child of God. But the child of God works don't define him, his knowledge, Holiness and his righteousness define him, producing good work for God to glorify him. And of course, we get to this part that said, I'm going to read 2.16. And the Lord God, <laughs> sorry, my mistake. <laughs> and the Lord God, now, remember in Genesis 1, it was just God. God the Father now is speaking to Adam and Eve. I got a picture, and we're going to advance that one forward. And here's this picture shows God with his hand on Adam's shoulder. Now, Adam, don't you touch that tree. You stay away from that tree. Don't eat of that tree. The artist put Eve there listening. I don't know how true that is, but I do know he said it to Adam. Go back in. He commands, Lord, Yahweh Elohim commands the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
pause, you ain't capable of, you're incapable or handling good and evil. I want to keep you pure in the good side of life. You shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Ooh. You shall surely die. Up until chapter three, we got God speaking. Chapter two, Elohim Yahweh is speaking. Chapter three, there is another voice speaking. And it's saying a whole lot of garbage that you and I should not be listening to. <laughs> when the scripture said that Adam was going to die, he finally died, but prior to that, his innocent died too. His innocentness died too. His understanding of things died. He saw it God's way until he ate of that fruit. And now he sees it a worldview way. And once it gets in us, we are switching back and forth, back and forth with all of this information, trying to decide confusion. Cause before it was plain to him what he should do. But once he ate of that fruit, confusion sets in. Doesn't confusion set in to you? How many of you, and I've seen this happen in the military, men, why? can handle your wife coming and tell you, you know, I'm leaving you. I had a soldier that happened to in the military. He's in Desert Storm, defending the country, making it safe for her. And she sends a letter to him saying, I'm leaving you. I don't want to be your wife no more. How would you handle that? Confusion, lies, deceit. All that stuff crept in when we act out disobedient. The moral, the, the least moral of that story is that soldier took a gun, turned it on himself and shot himself. They had to eat back himself back to the world. But guess what the sad part is? He did it to get back with her and she still left him. Can you handle that? But with God, we can handle it. We can, we really can. I tell the guys out at the prison, if one woman leaves you, God has made several more and some of them are Christian. Go and find that Christian woman and you marry her and you live happily ever after in love. What do y'all think? Isn't that a good way to deal with life? If your boss fire you, get on your knees and pray to God and look for another job. Don't go home and say, whoa, it's me. God is with you. He promised us. He will always be with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. You know how he can do that? When I got baptized, and Peter said, repent every last one of you and be baptized in the water of the grave. He said, and receive the gift of the indwelling spirit. Everywhere I go, God is there. So that thought in my head is he's everywhere because that's part of his attribute. I mean, I need to pay close attention to me, no matter what this confusion happened to us, because we all, at one time, according to Ephesians, we were dead in trespasses and sin, every last one of us. But then we heard the word, we switched off part of that deadness, and we got these two worlds in us now. We got God on one side, got Satan over here. Like that joke I heard. The guy saw a lady, she looked really nice. <laughs> and then the guy said, I shouldn't be looking at that woman. Get thee behind me, Satan. Satan says, she looks pretty good back there too. I want you to think about it. That's God saying, don't do it. And Satan said, do it. You get to choose. By the knowledge of God, you have to walk away. The Holy Spirit said, Walk in holiness as your God is holy. So then, the confusion, Ian, you're too far, Ian. Go back. The confusion is, and I don't know if you can read that, but this is Genesis 3.15. This is where God confronted the sinners. At any given moment, we are confronted 
by God trying to change things in our life. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That's the confusion that's going on in the world. It's all combobulated. It's just messed up. And one minute we hear, we feeling good about ourselves, but when we go out into the world, we're going back out into this confusion, this battle, the enmity, the hatred, the chaos, and we have to deal with that. In one camp, we are righteous, we are holy, and we got the knowledge of God. That other camp, they're coming at you with everything they got. In one camp, we learn to, to you know, play with love. And so then we try to invade that camp that they in the Satan kingdom and try to talk to those people. And when they reject you, you go and you leave them alone. Uh, I said this morning in the Bible class, uh, sprinkle a little word of God, sprinkle a little word here, a little word there, and allow God to give it the increase. That's our evangelistic practice. Don't be afraid to say, I'm blessed when someone asks you, how's your day going? Don't be afraid to say Merry Christmas. Uh, they have pushed us back into a hole. It came way back in about, I think it's the 60s, when the Johnson Amendment was passed and said that churches no longer can speak against evil. If you do, you will lose your tax exempt status, so preachers stop preaching it. And we stopped living it because we weren't hearing it. But guess what? <laughs> The government didn't give us our freedom. The president can't tell me when to talk about God. If he can, God will say, well, I need to raise up some stone and speak on my behalf because you are silent. Don't be silent. Speak for God. Sprinkle. Don't pour. I'm happy to be a Christian. Somebody said, what are you doing today? Why don't I put Sunday this morning? I'm, I'm going to worship. I'm trying to hurry home. And the person will invite you into their world if they want to hear. They don't walk away. What did Jesus say? Or Paul said, one of them said it. If they don't want to hear, Jesus, if they don't want to hear it, what you should do, shake the dust off your feet and move on. You're going to find someone. But in Washington, in this part of the world, it's one out of 1,000, maybe one out of 100. And you got to go through that 100, that 1,000 to find that one sheep. Amen. I don't know where you are in the Lord. If you're in the kingdom of Satan, or you're in the kingdom of God. When we think about the kingdom, we have to think about reign and rule of Satan in your life, or the reign and rule of God in your life. If God is reigning in your life, and God is ruling in your life, then I say, be holy, seek his righteousness, and daily study his word for knowledge. Something will come and be revealed to you that may help you during that present day. Don't worry about tomorrow. Only for that day should be suffice. And if you take care of today, <laughs> tomorrow will be all right. Guaranteed. God made me that promise because he's with me. But then I don't know your heart. I don't know where you are when it comes to whose kingdom you're in. But if you're not in the Lord's kingdom, John said, if you believe and obey, then eternal life is yours. If you don't believe and don't obey, then the wrath, oh yeah, it says it, the wrath of God presses up against you. I don't know if you ever heard a sermon about wrath, but it's a scary thought to be under the hands of an angry God, his wrath being poured out. I invite you to do what Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Stop that, pause that. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus has all authority given to him over heaven and earth. Jesus, by the name, is the power by which you are doing what you have to do. He said, do it, you have to do it. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, we have to do it. Then we continue to read, for the forgiveness of sin. Now, I did a study of a guy called Walter Scott, and that's where we get this plan of salvation from. 
Walter Scott says that you should believe and repent and be baptized. And we learn that the five ways hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And that's our gospel. The gospel should never be just like that one side. It should be balanced. If I'm baptized, what am I getting for baptism? I'm getting the forgiveness of sin and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is a gift from God given to you for obeying him and believing in his son and being baptized. I think that's is a feeling that, oh, I love it. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. I feel like Paul, he said, Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners, and I'm chief. And me, Paul, going to have an argument when we get into heaven. I said, Paul, you thought you were chief. I said, I was chief. And we might get on the ground and start wrestling and trying to determine who's chief. But right now, I'm just happy that Jesus died for my sin. What about you? Well, if you're happy, you got to do something with it. Or else, it's just going to weigh you down. It's going to be a burden to you. you got to find a way to say, Jesus is my Lord. I'm a Christian. I love the righteousness of God. I love trying to live this life. And like the guy that we walk named John, he said, a guy came up to him and said, you need to put your dog on a leash. He says, you know, Bob, I couldn't say nothing, but you're right. <laughs> so I say, say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I was wrong and move on. That's the Christian model. With that in mind, let us stand and sing the invitation song and go home and get in our affirmations. There's a fountain free to sport. And the saints so free. It's a fountain of love from the source above. And he bids.
So above you can see a list of all the people that we have on the prayer list. I'll give you a moment to look at that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are very thankful for the opportunity to be here, to hear Bobby speak of the word and to encourage us and show us who you are and, and who we need to be beholden to and, and praying for. Father, it's been very difficult times, as you can see by the prayer list we have is very long and almost most assuredly the number of people that have health issues and spiritual issues probably double or triple than what we see on this. Father, for, for those people that have health issues, if, you, if you'd be willing, please be with those people and the doctors that are providing them treatment that they can get better and be able to to worship you once again and to praise you for, for all that, that you, you do for us. And for those that have spiritual issues, Father, may we be encouraged to go out and find these people and to speak with them, to encourage them, to show them that they are loved, to show them that you still love them. And may they be pricked in some way to come back to, to the fold and to be able to come here once again and worship you and to show their love for you. Father, there are also many people who have lost loved ones and as difficult as that is for, for us to deal with, please continue to provide comfort to, to these families and also for, for us to continue to reach out and provide comfort and love and to show these people that you know we, we love them dearly and, and we love their family members that were lost as well. Father, as we go into this week, this, these next couple of days already, we know it's going to be very difficult for us as the temperatures are actually at lethal levels. And just hopefully people here can remember to continue to remain hydrated, to stay in cool areas if possible, or just stay indoors if, if there's nothing else they can do. And just continue to be with all of us and continue to, to bless all of us. And, May we all be back here next week at the appointed hour to, to worship you once again. We ask all this, your son, for you. Amen.